What a thrill to be here. Um, I first discovered TED about five years ago in 2007. And it came along at the right time for me because at that particular time I was kind of getting over a trauma which was the, the collapse of a business partnership that left me in a tough spot. And I was in need of inspiration. And boy, does TED have it in oodles. So I started looking at the website, the TED Talks website, and there were many, many things in it which gave me some ideas as to how I was going to move my life forward. I loved hearing about Seth Godin, who wrote about you know, the purple cow and how we can make ideas spread and how we can build a tribal following for something we want to achieve. But it was actually more the story talks that spoke to me on a personal level. And there was one in particular, um, a young man called William Kamkwamba, who really kind of touched me, it moved me, this story. When William was 14 and growing up in Malawi, at the time Malawi was suffering really, really bad from famine. And his father had to pull him out of school because he couldn't afford the $80 a year fee to send him to school. But William nonetheless was a very dedicated student. He wasn't to be denied his education. So he found a local library and he read two books in particular that were about science because that was his thing. And one of them was called Using Energy. And in reading these books, he taught himself how to build a working windmill out of scrap metal parts from the local tip. Now, his parents thought he was nuts doing this, but they got quite interested when it powered one light, two lights, three lights in the house, and then a couple of radios. And he began to think, well, maybe I'm onto something here, particularly when he looked down one day and there were a queue of people outside waiting to charge their mobile phones up. So what happened after that was even more interesting. Some local bloggers heard about him, they blogged about him, and then he came to the attention of the TED community in the States, and they dispatched somebody to track him down and asked him to speak on the stage in Arusha in Tanzania and share his story. And he was interviewed by Chris Anderson. The response was phenomenal. Everybody stood up on their feet and applauded. People offered to pay for his education in the audience. And he's now part of the global voice for sustainable energy, and he's had a book written about him, you know, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Now, that story to me spoke to me not so much on the environmental angle. It was because here was a young man who had followed his heart, followed his passion, reinvented his situation, and moved himself into a different place. He engineered a new future, not by knowing where he was going to go, but by simply following something he felt strongly about. And that kind of spoke to me. Maybe I could do the same thing and move myself to a different place too. Another story that moved me, and this lady's actually in the front row, I'm happy to say, is Sarah Knowles. Sarah was 12 years with the British Council. She loved her work, she traveled extensively, she used to live in Slovenia, she speaks fluent Slovene, and then one day after 12 years doing the work that she loved, it was all swept away in one fell swoop because she was made redundant. Now, she got outplacement support, which was in the form of help with CV skills and interview techniques, but it felt a bit mechanical, it felt a bit soulless, it felt like a, a tick box exercise, it wasn't inspiring. She got precious little help from the job center because the job center struggle to know what to do with people like Sarah. You know, they work in a niche industry, they're professionals. So she started blogging. And she blogged about the thing that she loved doing, which was the work that had been taken away from her. And in contrast to the experience of pushing a CV off into a, an unresponsive marketplace and hoping for the best and getting rejected, people found her. And not just anybody. She was tracked down by the Slovenian cultural ambassador who said, Sarah, I love what you've written. Could you come and speak at an event that my embassy is organizing in Holland? And she said, what? Me? And they said, yes, you. This was a mother of two, unemployed in Hanforth, who had now essentially found her voice and engineered a different future for herself, rather like William did. So I started thinking about things, and Sarah and I actually went on to form a company together. I started thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to look more deeply at what was at play here with these stories that were actually engineering change for people. I started thinking about how stories can bring about positive change. And I thought about it, I thought, well, I've always been interested in stories. Where did it come from? 
And it came from my mum. My mum's very elderly now. She's in a, a nursing home. But there's nothing wrong with her long-term memory. She actually knows things about my childhood that I've completely forgotten. And I'm convinced that the nursing staff know more about my childhood than I do. Because she shares stories all the time. So that's where I got it from. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. There's something clearly at play here with all this sh story sharing stuff. It's got the capacity to be an agent for change. So I got more into it, I looked into it, and this is what I discovered. If you're um, a job seeker, and there's lots of people out there in this position at the moment, you're in a pickle, in a dilemma, because it's a very, very crowded marketplace. You have to stand out. And we're all told, aren't we, that we need a USP. We need a unique selling point. And we put things on CVs like good people skills, you know, good team player, adaptable. Everybody says the same thing. We do this in companies as well. We say, you know, we're, we're really hot on customer service. We invest in our people. That's not a USP. That's a CSP. That's a common selling point. So how's this for a USP? What about building on and communicating more about what makes you you? because you're the thing that's unique in your life, the things that you've done, the people that you know, the experiences that you've had. So we encourage people not so much to talk about their experience, but their experiences, and those things are best shared anecdotally. Those things are your personal real estate, and nobody can interfere with it because you're in those stories. So if you want to stand out, build on the things that you've done and share them anecdotally. Now, you may ask, well, does this work? You know, what's the evidence to suggest that this works? Well, we have uh, someone in our network called Richard, and he was out of work for quite some time. We started working with Richard on how he told his story, you know, essentially when he was looking for interviews or indeed got an interview. And it turned out, once we dug a little bit deeper, that he once traveled from Manchester to Paris on a bike ride for charity, this was the Katie Piper charity. I think she was the young woman who had acid thrown in her face when she was facially disfigured. That story spoke to him. He decided to go on a charity bike ride, but not just that, dressed as a butler, as you do. He dressed as a butler. He got Costa Coffee, the coffee chain, to sponsor him. And here he is serving coffee in Northampton. And there he is serving a meal in a four-star hotel in Paris, still dressed as a butler. Now, needless to say, Richard then went on to get a job. I'm not saying it was specifically because of that, but it was because he started sharing more things that were in his personal story vault. He didn't try to be impressive by saying the right things. He was authentic. He was himself. This was another talk that really moved me on TED. This is a lady called Brené Brown. Now, Brené Brown spoke beautifully. I think it was at TEDx Houston about the power of vulnerability. If you're in an influencing situation, if you're a leader or a salesperson or indeed a job seeker, if you're looking to influence people's behavior, what we often feel is that we can't show any weakness. We can't talk about things that have gone wrong because it indicates a weakness as an implied vulnerability. But she showed through her research that vulnerability and embracing it and expressing it in the form of a story helps people to connect with you on a much deeper level, a much deeper level. Now, what's interesting, if you're speaking, if you can show openness and vulnerability to an audience, the audience is more likely to mirror your openness and be more receptive to your ideas. They kind of adopt your attitude in a way, your stance. But again, where's the evidence? Well, we worked with a young man a while ago who was a senior manager. He'd actually got up the, the, the leadership ladder quite fast, but he was having great difficulty connecting with his team. There were problems with low you know, engagement scores. They weren't connecting with him on an emotional level. And we explored his why. Why did he feel the way he did about his work? What were his values? And they, they were actually rooted in his dyslexia. And he'd always denied having it. He'd always hidden it. He'd always felt it would be seen as a weakness. So he didn't tell anybody about it. But this time he did. He showed, he told his story to his staff. 
He told them how his values of fairness and justice were actually born out of his own experiences with dyslexia. And the results were astonishing. People who'd never spoken to him before came up to him and said, I never knew that about you. Would you mind if I shared something as well? And the connection had been made. But enough of the impact on the audience. What about the impact on the storyteller? This intrigued me. When I was sort of five years ago coming out of this difficult spot, I went to a meeting of the Professional Speakers Association in Manchester. And I was sat next to a young man, well, young, yes, young, in his 30s, called Richard. And I said, do you know who the guest speaker is today? And he said, yes, it's me. So I felt a bit of an idiot. I said, well, what do you speak about? He says, well, you'll find out if you listen. So then I felt even more stupid. And it turns out that when Richard was five in 1975, the police informed him that his mummy had gone to heaven. And his name's Richard McCann, and his mother was the first victim of Peter Sutcliffe, better known as the Yorkshire Ripper. And what happened to Richard after that doesn't even bear thinking about. It was drugs, gangs, prison, got out of prison, got into the army, managed to get himself together a bit, got kicked out of the army for psychiatric reasons. I mean, what hasn't happened to this poor man, you don't want to know. But the thing that got him out of his trough was that somebody said to him, Richard, you should write a book about your story. You should share it with people. And he wrote a book, and it became a Times number one bestseller. It knocked Robbie Williams off the number one spot, which tickled him immensely. And he's now shared his story 1,200 times on stage and travels the world telling people what happened to him and how he overcame it. It's the most extraordinary story. But I interviewed him a, a few weeks ago, and I said, Richard, what's telling your story done for you? How has it changed you on the inside? And he said, well, well for one thing, it helped me regain my confidence, because obviously my confidence was shot after all the things that had happened to me. But he said, the other thing it helped me do was it helped me to make sense of my life. If you tell your story, you have to reflect on things that have happened before. It helped him kind of join the dots, so to speak. He could see how that led to that, led to that. Things happened for a reason. Steve Jobs spoke about this. He gave a commencement address at Stanford University some years ago, and he spoke about joining the dots in reverse. He said, sometimes you can't tell where your life is going to go, but you can retrospectively make sense of it and join the dots in reverse. So sometimes the impact on the storyteller is very cathartic, and again, it's something we can embrace if we've gone through difficulties, or indeed we want people to understand us better as well. So to summarize, what I think is at play here is a bit of past, present, and future. We have to look back. If we're going to tell our story, if we're going to tell a story, we need to look at what has happened. We need to look back at the history, at the memories that we have, and it helps us make sense of things. But then, of course, the present is the moment of sharing. It's the moment when that story lands on the audience. It's when you hear it for the first time and the impact that it has on you. And the interesting thing is that you will always take something from it that relates to you. I took something from William's story, which wasn't so much about environmental change. It was about how an individual who was in a tough spot managed to reinvent himself and take him somewhere else. That was the thing that, that personalized it to me. And you do the same thing when you hear people's stories. But the other thing that's interesting is what happens in the future. What do you do with that story? How do you change the way you behave as a result of hearing what someone's done? And how also does it change them having shared it? TED is all about sharing ideas. It's about how ideas spread. It's stories worth spreading. So it's not, it's ideas worth spreading. And I think that ideas spread better if they're wrapped up in a story, if they're crafted around a story. I don't think William's story would have been nearly as powerful if it had been about sustainable energy, if it had been about new ways of producing electricity um, you know, that didn't damage the environment. I think Richard's story was, sorry, William's story was more powerful 
because of the context in which it started, because of the determination that he showed to pursue a course when other people told him he was, he was being ridiculous, and then what happened to him afterwards as a result of doing what he did. I think that's what makes it powerful. So my final, my parting message to you, if I may, is that if you've got an idea that you think is worth spreading, and we're going to talk a lot today about change, particularly in the field of areas like global health, if you've got an idea that you think is worth spreading, if you can wrap a story around it, if you can make it authentic, if you can convey it in a passionate way from the heart, then there's every chance that that idea will sprout wings and take flight. Thank you.